Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Emerald, where the enemy Pokemon always lands a critical hit. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. If you've ever watched to the end of one of my videos, you'll know that I always end my videos with the phrase, always play around the critical hit. Advice that I often tend to ignore myself. But what if you had to actually play around the critical hit? What if every single time the enemy attacked, they landed a critical hit? How much more difficult would a hardcore Nuzlocke be? Well, with the help of none other than the amazing ROM hack creators Dreano and Xluma, I was able to find out. These guys worked directly with my uncle Jim Tendo to develop a version of Pokemon Emerald, where without fail, the enemy will always land a critical hit. In Generation 3, that means that all enemy attacks are essentially doubled in power. Critical hits also completely ignore stat boosts and drops, meaning that moves like Iron Defense and abilities like Intimidate are completely useless. This mod certainly made for a unique challenge. Just as a quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, now let's see how this goes. The story begins as I step out of the back of a moving truck that my mom has shoved me into. We've just moved to the Hoenn region for the promise of economic prosperity. My father has taken a job as the gym leader of Petalburg City, leaving my mother and me to completely unroot our lives and settle in a few towns over. I guess the Petalburg City real estate market is a little too competitive on a gym leader's salary. I was promised adventure, but on first impression, this ain't Hollywood. This is a small town, and I'm gonna need some more excitement. That comes in the form of Professor Birch getting attacked by a Zigzagoon, which lets me pick my starter Pokemon. People are probably tired of me choosing Mudkip in my Hoenn playthroughs, but here it's pretty much objectively the right choice for reasons you'll see throughout the playthrough. After tackling the Feral Raccoon into the ground, Professor Birch lets me keep Mudkip. I name her Mud, and then our whirlwind journey begins. Our first challenge is to fight our rival May, but we obviously can't do that at Mud's current level because of the critical hits. So it's time for some grinding. And as you can see from the grinding, the enemy Pokémon do indeed get critical hits every single time. This makes grinding much harder and more tedious because even at low levels, wild Pokémon deal huge amounts of damage with consistent critical hits. Side note here, in most of my playthroughs, I will use rare candies to level up my Pokémon. I personally do this because grinding is incredibly tedious and tends to be pretty low risk as long as you're patient and not reckless. Yes, grinding deaths do happen, and rare candies do remove that chance, but for me, personally, I find that using rare candies helps me drastically reduce the time needed to complete certain challenges, meaning that I can release videos to you all more consistently without, in my opinion, compromising the truly skill-based part of the playthrough. In my opinion. That being said, because grinding is extra risky in this playthrough, I decided to not use rare candies at least for the first few gyms until I get access to the daycare center, where you can freely just level up your Pokémon by walking around. Anyways, after a while I get Mud to a comfortably high level, and I flatten May's Trico like a pancake. Mudkip has the highest attack stat of all the three starter Pokémon, and Trico doesn't know Growl, so even with a few missed tackles, we are plenty strong enough to win this battle. From here, I get to start catching teammates. As usual, with challenges that I don't have as many encounter restrictions on, I'll only be touching on the encounters that actually contribute in the video. For now though, all of these Pokémon will at least show up in the layout. Starting first with Zigzagoon from Route 103, who I name Ratatouille. I know that that's spelled wrong, but Ratatouille with two L's doesn't fit. I also catch a Poochyanna named Old Yeller from Route 102, a Wormpole named Bugs Life from Route 104, which quickly evolves into a Dustox, and a Slackoth named Zootopia from Petalburg Woods. Once we get to Rustboro City, I use a Rappel to first go to Wismer Tunnel or whatever it's called, and catch a Wismer. I name her 8 Mile. Her special skill set will be very useful later. Then, on Route 116, I manage to find an Abra as my first Pokémon. I also get lucky enough to actually catch him with a single Great Ball before he teleports away. So, Moonlight joins the team, though for now he doesn't have a way to deal damage. That's okay though, because for the first gym, Mud is able to handle the battle all by herself. Both of Roxanne's Geodudes fall to a single water gun apiece. Can't get crit if you outspeed and one-shot. That's going to be the mantra of this playthrough. Unfortunately, we don't one-shot Nosepass, but Roxanne is kind of a crap battler, and the Gen 3 AI is pretty wonky. 
Specifically, once your Pokémon is slower, Roxanne will never go for Rock Tomb. She also wastes some turns using Harden and Block, so we win the battle without too much trouble. Immediately after the battle, Mud evolves into Marsh Tom, which is one of the only ways to reliably beat Watson if you don't get lucky enough to get a Geodude from Granite Cave, which I don't. I get a Zubat, who I named the Dark Knight. Then I head deep into Granite Cave to deliver Mr. Stone's letter to Steven. Okay, like I get that the Pokenav doesn't work in caves, so Mr. Stone can't contact Steven while he's in the cave, but can't you just leave a voicemail? Steven's gotta come out eventually. It certainly doesn't seem like an underage postman is the best way to get in contact with your son. But anyways, after that, I head to Slateport City and catch an Electric from Route 110 and name her Moneyball. As a kid, Electric and Manetric were some of my favorite Pokemon, so it's cool to finally get to use one in a challenge here. With that, it's time to fight Brawly, who with a 100% critical hit rate is pretty terrifying. If it weren't for Moonlight. Now that he's evolved into Kadabra, he's able to completely melt the minds of Brawly simpletons with a few confusions. It takes two confusions to knock out the Metatite, but the other two are easy one-shots. Had I not gotten Kadabra, I likely would have had to do this fight with Zubat and Dustox, both of who are four times resistant to fighting type attacks. But clicking confusion four times is way easier. So that's cool. Before leaving Duford Town, I fish up a Tenacool who I name Alien. Then it's off to Mauville City. Along the way, I have to fight my rival. This fight can either be incredibly easy or super difficult depending on the playthrough. Fortunately in this case, it's the former. She leads with a Wingull who gets zapped out of the sky by a single spark from Moneyball. Slugma comes in next and I switch to Mud. He does get burned by the Ember on the switch, but then we take out Slugma with a single Water Gun. Or not. Wow, that's kinda sad. Fortunately, it doesn't really matter since Slugma is pretty bad. Grovile is last. So I switch to Bug's Life, who takes nothing from an Absorb. Pursuit and Quick Attack do decent damage, but Bug's Life knows Moonlight, so he's able to stay healthy all the while hitting Grovile with Gusts. After a few turns, Grovile falls, and the battle is easily won. We'll just go ahead and ignore the rival battles from here on out. That's about all there is of note before facing Watson for the third gym badge. A few of our Pokémon have evolved, including 8 Mile, who is now a Loudred. The Wismer line has a very special skill set that will be invaluable to this fight. Watson leads with Voltorb, and I lead with Mud. Right away, I switch to 8 Mile so that she can work her magic and do what the Wismer line does best. Die. To a critical hit self-destruct from Voltorb. Someone was gonna have to take that self-destruct, and nothing was surviving a crit, so hopefully 8 Mile can rest well knowing that her short life had purpose. After that, I bring Mud back out, who is now free to blow through Watson's entire team. After howling once, Electrite goes down to a Mud Shot. Magneton is next and misses a Supersonic, so a Mud Shot takes them out as well. Manetric is last and starts firing off Quick Attacks, but they're not quite strong enough to put Mud in any real danger before two Mud Shots take him out. That still could have gone poorly if we missed a few Mud Shots or if Magneton actually connected with Supersonic and then Mud hit himself in confusion. But thankfully, we made it out with everyone alive. Okay, well, well not everyone, but war is hell. With the ability to smash rocks, the northwestern part of Hoenn is unlocked and brings a bunch of new encounters that will all be pretty useful. From Route 112, I catch a huge power Meryl named Platoon. From Fiery Path, I actually manage to find a Torkoal who I named Cabaret. I also catch a Swablu from Route 114 named The Birds. And thanks to the Zubat dupe, I can guarantee a Solrock from Meteor Falls who I named Solaris. So now I've got a pretty good team as I go to face Maxi on top of Mount Chimney, a fight that I consistently underestimate. Now, as you may have noticed from the previous gym fights, things go pretty well when I can outspeed and one-shot my opponents. Obviously, things become more complicated when I can't. And Maxi's Mightyena is actually kind of an issue because I don't have a single fighting type. I lead Cabaret, who takes stupid damage from a critical hit bite, and then fires back with a very weak Ember. Already not a great start. On the next turn, though, I switch to the Dark Knight, who I foolishly didn't bother evolving into a Crobat. Maxi then also switches out to his Camerupt. I switch to Mud, who gets hit by a pretty hard Ember, and then also gets burned. Mud loves getting burned by Embers. Fortunately, that's not a huge issue, because we can fire back with a times 4 super effective Water Gun. But that's not quite enough for the one-shot, so Mud goes down to a hard magnitude 7. That's a pretty bad loss, but now's not the time to mourn. I bring the Dark Knight back in. Maxi uses a Super Potion, and the Dark Knight hits a fairly hard Wing Attack. A second wing attack leaves Camera up in the red, so he fires off an ember, which does huge damage, but at least it doesn't burn. 
Maxi decides to not use another super potion here, so a third wing attack finishes off Camerupt. Then Mighty Anna comes out again, and Intimidate lowers our attack. So I switch to Ratatouille, who does take less than half of her health and damage from a bite. So I fire off a headbutt, which does good damage, and a second bite puts Ratatouille in the red. Maxi then uses another super potion, so a second headbutt doesn't finish off Mighty Anna. It also doesn't look like a third one will kill him, but I can't really afford to switch to anything else. So I hit another headbutt, hoping for a crit or a flinch. We get neither though, so Ratatouille falls to a follow-up bite. Yes, I found Ratatouille's missing L. From here, Moneyball comes in and sparks Mighty Anna to knock him out. She also sparks Maxi's Zubat for the one-shot, which does win us the battle, and I guess somehow also stops Maxi from blowing up Mount Chimney. But it's a hollow victory given that I lost my starter and a Pokemon named after a top 5 Pixar movie. Ratatouille just wanted to cook, Maxi. Have a heart. Candidly though, Mud is the more brutal of the two losses given that we have the Fire Gym coming up. Without her, we're going to need to bring some Pokemon off the bench, including Platoon the Meryl, who I evolve into a Zoomeril. I also pump her with as many special attack EVs as I can, by killing Wild Numel so that her water moves will do decent damage and we don't end up having another mud scenario against Flannery's camera up. As our battle against Flannery begins, Alien the Tentacool has joined the team, and both Moneyball and the Dark Knight have evolved. Flannery's first three Pokemon all fall to a Bubble Beam apiece from Platoon. They're never particularly difficult. It's her ace, Torkoal, that's the real issue. Critical hit overheats, especially in the sun, do insane amounts of damage. And it's not like Platoon can one-shot Torkoal. Unless she gets a critical hit, I guess. We gotta say, that's super anticlimactic. But hey, I'll take it. That is a shockingly easy 4th gym badge obtained. With that, I'm able to head to the desert on Route 11, where I can catch a Sandshrew named Ladybird, as well as a Trap Inch in Mirage Tower named Dune. I also pick up a Root Fossil, which I turn into a Lilip named Nomadland, though I won't be using her. That now gets us to the fight against my father Norman for batch number 5. His slaking can be cheesed with any Pokemon that knows Protect or Dig, of which I have three. So I'm not too worried about the big guy. Norman's other Pokemon are still an issue though, since they hit hard and fast, and we still don't have a fighting type. I lead with Moneyball as Norman leads with Spinda. I'm hoping he wastes a turn using Teeter Dance, but after we hit a spark, Norman just goes for a hard facade. This activates Moneyball's static, but it doesn't really matter because Spinda falls to a second spark on the next turn. Vigoroth is second, so I switch to Solaris, who takes a good chunk from Slash despite resisting it. Then Solaris barely tanks a faint attack and gets off a rock throw for a small amount of damage. An Orenberry restores a bit of health here, but we're obviously dead to another hit, so I switch to Ladybird, who has evolved into Sandslash. A feint attack does a bit of damage. Vigoroth then outspeeds on the next turn to hit a pretty hard slash as Ladybird goes for a dig. This leaves Vigoroth in the red. So Norman heals with a Hyper Potion as I take the chance to hit Vigoroth with a cheeky sand attack. That instantly pays off as Vigoroth misses a slash and Ladybird gets off another dig. That does more than half health, so after just barely surviving another slash, one final dig finishes off Vigoroth. This brings in Lanoon, who is terrifying since he's very fast and knows Belly Drum, but at least for this turn Lanoon should be going for an attack since he sees the kill. So I switch to Cabaret, who takes just a crap load of damage from a headbutt. Aren't Torkoals supposed to be bulky? After having so many difficult fights against Flannery's Torkoal, honestly I feel a little cheated here. Fortunately Cabaret will still survive another attack, and fortunately er, Lanoon just goes for a greedy Belly Drum so a follow-up flamethrower knocks him out. That works out perfectly because Slay King of course is last, and Cabaret learns Protect through level up. So it is incredibly easy to protect when Slay King attacks, hit Toxic when he loafs, and then supplement the toxic damage with flamethrower for a few turns until we slay the king. Like with Kadabra against Brawly, I did get pretty lucky that my fiery path encounter turned out to be a Torkoal, but Dustox could have actually done the same thing. Anyways, that's badge number 5. With access to Surf now, it's time to explore the high seas. I start by catching a Wingull from Route 105 named The Lighthouse. I also catch a Carvana named Jaws from Route 118, and an Oddish named Moana from Route 119. All of these guys will be important later. I also catch an Absol from Route 120 and name him The Godfather. Absol is all but guaranteed on this route thanks to Species Clause. He'll show up for like 2 seconds in about 5 minutes. But first, it's time for Winona. Fortunately, she's pretty easy with the encounters I've gotten. Alien, who has evolved into Tentacruel, is strong enough and fast enough to take care of Swablu and Altaria with a single Ice Beam apiece. 
Altaria comes in second here because he's baited by Earthquake on Alien, so this actually works out perfectly. I'm not actually confident that Alien will get a one-shot with Surf against the Skarmory that comes in third, and a critical hit Aerial Ace will hit pretty hard, so I just switch to Cabaret. She tanks a second Aerial Ace on the next turn, and then Flamethrower knocks her out. Pelipper comes in fourth as Cabaret's Citrus Berry activates. I switch to Moneyball as Pelipper tries to go for a Protect. Classic. After some Protect shenanigans, a Spark knocks her out in one shot. Last is Tropius. I don't want this thing setting up a sunny day and getting the Chlorophyll speed boost, so I hit her with a Thunder Wave, which instantly pays off with a full Paralysis. This lets me safely switch to Alien as Tropius charges up a Solar Beam. But she'll never get it off, since an Ice Beam knocks her out in one shot on the next turn, winning us the battle. Tentacruel is just an amazing Pokemon for Nuzlocks. Naturally fast, naturally specially bulky, and with some special attack investments, a very solid special attacker. Seriously, this thing can carry runs. As long as nothing happens to it, of course. Anyways, with that random aside that certainly isn't well-timed foreshadowing, I now have a rematch with Maxi, who couldn't possibly kill yet another one of my Pokémon, right? I lead with Alien as Maxi leads with Mightyana. Mightyana threatens to hit the physically frail Alien with a very hard takedown, but we outspeed and nail him with a Surf. And Mightyana just goes for Swagger. Phew. I switch to Cabaret as Mightyana heals. He then goes for another Swagger, but Cabaret fortunately breaks through and kills him with a Flamethrower. Camerupt is next, so I switch to the Lighthouse expecting an Earthquake, but nope, he just goes for an Amnesia. A Surf no longer kills Camerupt, but he just goes for another Amnesia despite having Rock Slide. I was fully prepared to sack the Lighthouse there for some damage, but I guess I don't have to. Despite a Super Potion, two more Surfs finish off Camerupt. Last is Crobat, who immediately hits a very hard wing attack, but then Lighthouse retaliates with a Surf. A Citrus Berry activates, meaning we'll survive another wing attack, so I stay in to hit another Surf. Instead of wing attack though, Crobat just goes for Confuse Ray, which causes the Lighthouse to hit himself in confusion. So then I switch to Moneyball, who sorta tanks a wing attack. This does trigger a lucky static, so we're able to outspeed and knock out Crobat with a spark on the next turn, winning us the battle. What, you thought Alien was gonna die in that fight? Nah, see that's what we call misdirection. And this? This is, this is what we call reckless stupidity. Yeah, so basically what happens here is that when I was leaving the Magma Hideout, I accidentally ran into a wild Geodude. And because I was playing my very legit Game Boy on its special speedup mode, I kinda misclicked and attacked the Geodude with acid instead of running, which let the little guy blow up in my face. Whoops. No Tentacruel, I guess. Fortunately, this game is chock full of decent water types, so it's not the end of the world, but yeah, Tentacruel is really, really good. Rest in peace, alien. Well, after that, I raid the Team Aqua hideout and stumble into what appears to be Archie's office. There, I pick up the Master Ball. I also encounter an Electrode, which will be an incredibly useful Pokémon. The issue is that Electrode knows self-destruct, so it's pretty risky to try and capture them, lest they explode in my face. And I really don't like when things explode in my face. Fortunately, I just picked up a Master Ball. So, I use it. Welcome to the team, Hurt Locker. Now that I have an Electrode, I can head to New Mauville and guarantee a Magnemity. I thought I would actually use this Pokémon a lot, but they end up just mostly staying in the box. But I figured I'd mention them anyways, since people unanimously love how I pronounce Magnemite. Anyways, this gets us to the fight with Tate and Liza. Again, outspeeding and one-shotting is the name of the game here, because Tate and Liza's Pokémon are pretty terrifying, especially with critical hits. And who better to outspeed and one-shot than Hurt Locker? who eviscerates Claydol and Zatu with an explosion. I make sure to protect with Jaws so that there's no friendly fire, but that's that. Rest in peace, Hurt Locker. This lets me bring out the Godfather for his 5 seconds of fame, as Tate and Liza bring out Solrock and Lunatone. Lunatone's only damaging move is Psychic, so it's safe to double up on Solrock, who actually just goes down to a single crunch from Jaws. The Godfather then lands a critical hit bite into Lunatone, which leaves him with a sliver. So, they get off a Calm Mind and their Citrus Berry activates, but it doesn't matter, because another crunch from Jaws on the next turn takes them out, winning us the 7th Gym Badge. With that, I now have to fight Maxi for the third and final time. This time, it's a multi-battle with Steven and Admin Tabitha. I thought this battle had the potential to be pretty tough, but it turns out that since Steven counts as AI, he also always crits, and that ends up making the fight much easier than I expected. Oh well. 
Archie is also a cakewalk since his water dark type Sharpedo does not know a water or a dark type attacking move. So after resolving the Weather Wars by awakening Rayquaza, all that's left to do before the Elite Four is take on the eighth and final gym leader, Juan. But that's a bit of an issue. Juan has a Kingdra which knows double team and rest, meaning that this thing is a massive pain in the ass to deal with if you can't knock him out in one shot or get pretty lucky. It's hard to get the one shot since Kingdra is only weak to dragon type moves and is fairly bulky. Kingdra can also hit really hard with critical hit water pulses and ice beams. Basically, Kingdra is a nightmare in this playthrough and I really don't have an easy way to deal with him. What I come up with requires almost a completely new team. First I catch a Sveal from Shoal Cave named Frozen and a Chinchow from Underwater named Anchorman, both of who evolve. I also evolve the birds the Swablu into Altaria, and I use a Sunstone to evolve Moana the Oddish all the way into a Blossom. With these new teammates, I have a pretty good answer into Juan's Kingdra as well as the rest of his team. Juan leads with a Love Disc, so I lead with Moneyball, who is quickly becoming my most reliable team member. She outspeeds and kills Love Disc with a single Thunderbolt. This brings out Whiskash, who threatens with an Earthquake. So I switch to Moana, but of course Whiskash just uses Amnesia. That ends up being fine because Moana just crits with a Magical Leaf for the one shot. That's what you get for setting up, sucker. Celio is out third, so I switch to Frozen on an Aurora Beam. Thanks to her Thick Fat ability, the cold never bothered her anyways. Then I switch to Moneyball, who tanks a Body Slam and thankfully does not get fully paralyzed. This lets her knock out Celio with another Thunderbolt. Fourth is Crawdont, who obviously also falls to a Thunderbolt. So last is the problematic Kingdra. And here's where this battle becomes a nightmare for me to edit. Ultimately, the plan is to stall Kingdra out of his 20 Water Pulse PP and his 10 Ice Beam PP. At first, I try to take out the Kingdra by locking him into double team with Encore from Frozen and then hitting Magical Leafs with Moana, but we just don't do enough damage and Kingdra's Encore wears off before we can seal the deal. So stall tactics it is. All the Pokemon I have in my party can tank at least a few hits from either Ice Beam or Surf, and many of them know Protect to stall out even more turns. The main staller is Frozen, who also knows Rest. So as long as I switch out when Water Pulse manages to Confuse, it's a fairly safe stall. Let's just skip most of it. I eventually get Kingdra to the point where he can only use Double Team because he's ran out of PP on all his other moves. So I bring Moana back in. She can now safely fire away with Magical Leafs, which are doing decent damage. Kingdra quickly resorts to using Struggles, which actually do a lot of damage since they still crit. Fortunately, Moana has access to Moonlight, so even though Wan does heal, she's able to survive and finish off the Kingdra with a few more Magical Leafs. That wins us the 8th and final Gym Badge. So now it's Elite Four time, but before that, in Victory Road, I finally get a fighting type in the form of Hariyama. I name him Fight Club, and despite getting him at the very end of the playthrough, he will be joining us for the Elite Four. So here's my final team, leveled up to level 55 to match Drake's Salamence. In addition to Fight Club, Dune also makes a late appearance in the 6th and final slot, having evolved into a Flygon. I just couldn't help myself. There's a few pretty tricky Pokemon that we'll have to face in the Elite Four, but I'm confident that these six have what it takes to clinch a win. What could possibly go wrong? First up is Sydney. He leads Mightyana, and I lead with Jaws, which is definitely not a mistake. I definitely didn't order my team to match the order of the sprites in the layout for the final team footage and then forget to switch Fight Club back into the lead before fighting Sydney, that's for sure. Yeah, I definitely meant to lead with Jaws here. Now because the level cap is so much higher than Sydney's team in these games, Jaws is still able to one-shot Mightyana with a Surf. Cacturn comes in second and goes down to an Ice Beam. Shiftry follows suit and also falls to a single Ice Beam. Broadont is fourth, so I switch to Fight Club as he greedily goes for a Swords Dance. Then a Brick Break kills Crawdon. Absol is last, but because I put this sumo wrestler through some speed training, he's actually able to outspeed and kill Absol with a single Brick Break as well, winning us the battle. Second for the Elite Four is Phoebe, but as with Sydney, this one should be pretty easy. After her first Dusclops does her court mandated protect, a crunch from Jaws knocks her out in one shot. Phoebe's first Bayonet comes out next and obviously goes down to a crunch as well. Sableye is third and unfortunately just barely survives a surf, which lets her get off a double team. Super annoying. Phoebe heals and fortunately we do connect with another surf, which brings Sableye back into the red. But then I miss a crunch and Sableye hits a nightshade. I really hate double team. Fortunately we do connect with a second crunch and Sableye goes down. So no harm, no foul, right? 
Next is Phoebe's second Dusclops, who gets hit with a crunch, but survives with seemingly 1 HP, letting her clap back with a critical hit Earthquake, killing Jaws. That is really bad. Jaws was our only Pokemon that knows Ice Beam. AKA, he was incredibly important for dealing with Drake's Dragon types. We do still have Dune, who I did actually train in Special Attack, so she's able to finish off Phoebe's team with a few more crunches. But even with Max Special Attack, which we really don't have because Dune's Special Attack IV is 3, Dragon Claw certainly isn't killing Drake's Salamence, and Drake's Salamence is certainly killing Dune. Before having to deal with that though, we do have to fight Glacia. Fortunately, with the badge boost, our big boy is just speedy enough to be able to outspeed and kill all of Glacia's ice types with a single brick break apiece. It actually takes two brick breaks to kill Walrein, but Fight Club is able to tank a crit surf. So after some full restores, Walrein goes down and we win the battle. At least that was easy. But Drake? Yeah, Drake is a real problem. Ultimately, I kind of have to hope that the AI is a bit dumb. Since the AI doesn't know it's going to get a critical hit, I think, Drake might waste time setting up when he doesn't need to. He leads with Shelgon, and I lead with Dune. I really need you to pull through here, buddy. Shelgon always goes for a Protect, but we don't really have a setup move to abuse that, so we just hit into the Protect. A Dragon Claw then manages to kill Shelgon in one shot on the next turn. Drake then brings out his own Flygon for a Mirror Match. Luckily, Flygon isn't the bulkiest of boys, so we take him out with a single Dragon Claw as well. Third is Altaria, who tanks a Dragon Claw fairly well, but then just goes for a Dragon Dance. Since Altaria sucks, he doesn't outspeed Dune even after the plus one speed boost. So after using a full restore, another two Dragon Claws take him out. Next is Kingdra. Fortunately, he doesn't know a Dragon move, which is kind of weird, I don't know why he came out here, but at least it means he can't one-shot Dune here. Though if he uses Dragon Dance, he may be able to outspeed on the next turn, and then a plus one Body Slam crit might be enough for the one-shot. But Dune doesn't even give him the chance, and crits with Dragon Claw for the one-shot. Amazing. Though obviously we're hardly in the clear, because Salamence comes out as Drake's last Pokemon. So here's the deal. In order to beat the champion, I absolutely need to keep Moneyball, the Dark Knight, and Dune alive. I also probably need to keep at least one other Pokemon alive for switching purposes if things go poorly in the final fight. So what I do is I start by switching to Fight Club, who survives a critical hit Dragon Claw. Then I fire off a Fake Out for some Chip. And then, sadly, Fight Club takes one for the team and goes down. This lets me bring in Zootopia. Unfortunately, a return is just barely missing out on the kill here, and thanks to our true Aunt ability, I know I won't be getting off more than one attack. It'd also be really bad if Drake heals here. So I use Yawn as Salamence fires off another nasty Dragon Claw. Then I switch to the Dark Knight, who also tanks a Dragon Claw. This now causes Salamence to fall asleep. So now I gotta just pray that he doesn't get a one turn sleep. Dune comes in on Salamence's first turn of sleep. Then I fire off a Dragon Claw and pray. Salamence does survive with a sliver, but thankfully he stays asleep. So Drake heals, but by the skin of our teeth, we've made it out of this one alive. Two more Dragon Claws finish him off. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to hard switch to Zootopia, get off a return, and then have him go down to get a free switch into Dune. I think that would have been a bit more consistent, since we wouldn't have had to rely on sleep turns. But at the time, I thought that Fight Club was less useful than Zootopia for the Wallace fight, and I was actually hoping that he might maybe bait Fly from Salamence. Either way, it worked out, and we win the final Elite Four fight. All that's left now is Wallace, who has a surprisingly tough team, especially considering that it's actually a monotype team. But we got this, right? He leads with Wailord, and I lead with Good Pup Moneyball. A single Thunderbolt is all it takes to fell the big fish. Gyarados comes in second, which is hilarious. He knows Earthquake, so it does make sense, but Thunderbolt obviously knocks him out in one shot. Third is Whiskash, which is what I was expecting to come out second. I switch to Dune, who is immune to Whiskash's Earthquake. Then I set up a Sunny Day as Whiskash goes for an Amnesia. Thanks to Sunny Day, I can now fire off one turn Solar Beams, though Amnesia means that Whiskash does survive. But then he just goes for Amnesia again, because the AI loves using that move for some reason. So an Earthquake from Dune knocks out the Forgetful Fish. Fourth is Tenacruel, who threatens with Ice Beam, but we of course threaten with Earthquake, which kills him in one shot. And then fifth is my Lodic. Now sadly, I have to make the ultimate sacrifice. I have to sacrifice the one I love most, 
Dune has to go down. She's done her job, so there's nothing else for her to do but fire off one last solar beam into Milotic and then embrace her icy death. May your passage to the afterlife be swift and painless, Dune. This valiant sacrifice lets me bring in Moneyball and revenge kill Milotic with a Thunderbolt. So, last for Wallace is the always obnoxious Ludicolo since he knows Leech Seed and Double Team. But I came prepared. I switch to the Dark Knight as Ludicolo goes for a Double Team. Then, with our middle fingers thrust into the sky, we hit Ludicolo with an Aerial Ace that never misses. It doesn't quite kill, but Wallace, being the greedy bastard that he is, goes for yet another Double Team. And so, with the power of all eight sacrifices that were made to get us to this point, the Dark Knight finishes off Ludicolo with one last vengeful aerial ace, winning us the battle and the run. Well, there you have it. Looks like a hardcore Nuzlocke is possible, even if the enemy gets a critical hit every single time. This was a really fun and unique challenge, so let me know down in the comments if you want to see more runs like it, and I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow Dreano and Xluma on Twitter to keep up with all of their future projects. A special thanks to both of them for working on this mod. Links to their Twitters as well as a link to where you can download the mod yourself are in the description below. You can also follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You can also check out my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. Right now, I'm playing through Dreano's masterpiece of a ROM hack, Renegade Platinum, and it is an absolute blast. You should definitely check out some of that content. And finally, be sure to join the Flag on HG community Discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links for everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.